So today, I'm speaking on one of the most important areas where we need to be fruitful. Uh, fruitfulness in this one area will give you a testimony uh, to the world that you are truly a child of the Most High God. So I'm speaking today on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you pay attention to the declaration we make, uh, getting to the end, it says, My spirit bears fruits of righteousness. And that is what we are addressing, the fruit of the Spirit. Most of you have heard the term before, and we're going to explore it. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 23 will form the basis of our discussion this morning. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 23. And it reads, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is set out in opposition to the works of the flesh. And the works of the flesh are numerous but inconclusive. As you can see from the passage, and such like. There are about 15 set out in the passage, but not conclusive. So anything in proximity to and looking like any of these aforementioned works of the flesh are works of the flesh. So if you look at the passage, uh, you would find that the works of the flesh is set out in plural, while the fruit of the Spirit is set out in singular. So the fruit of the Spirit is not a plural word, it's a singular word, and the works, plural. Uh, so it, uh, basically it means that the fruit of the Spirit is not uh, something that you can choose and pick. Uh, it is one manifestation of the spirit and the works of the flesh are many and continue to be many in manifestation. The Greek word that is used and translated as works uh, means uh, something that you put energy into, something that you put effort into. And as most of you might have had the experience the works of the flesh require work. I know you don't want to respond to that. The works of the flesh require work. Anybody who has committed adultery knows it takes a lot of effort to commit adultery, a lot of planning, a lot of scheming, a lot of lying, a lot of hiding. By the time the act is over, you are exhausted. And afterwards, continue to work to hide your sins. The same with fornication, murder, and all the works 
of the flesh. But that's not what we are talking about, although I can sense a sense of nervousness. In this room, and even by those watching TV, I see the nervousness in your eyes. You're saying, Pastor, please leave it there. I will come on it one day, but since we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit, I will focus on the fruit of the Spirit. The word that is used uh, and described as fruit in the English is from the Greek word karpos, and karpos is used not only in relation to the Spirit, but it's used to describe all kinds of fruit from a plant, from a tree. Uh, it simply means the result of an action. And uh, as I said, note that the word is singular. The fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. So, in the context that it is used in this passage... It means something that is produced. Something that is produced. So when we say the fruit of the Spirit, it means something that the Spirit produces. The fruit of the Spirit. A fruit naturally comes out of something. Fruits don't just appear. They appear on something. So there is always a relationship between the fruit and the thing that produced it. So an orange fruit, for example, is produced from an orange tree. So there is a relationship between the tree and what it is producing. So when we say the fruit of the spirit, it is the spirit making the product. Not the flesh, but the spirit making the product. Something that is produced. Secondly, the word fruit also means something that is revealed. Something that is revealed. A fruit is not hidden. It is seen. And uh, you can all attest to it. Fruits are seen. You're walking by and you see a mango tree and you, it's bearing fruit. It is evident. You can see it. You can see the fruit of an orange tree. Even if it is bearing fruit underneath, uh, that is a, a root-bearing fruit, when you uproot it, you would see the fruit. Fruit is something that is revealed. It is seen. And because a fruit is seen, it can be judged. You can judge it to determine whether it is a good fruit or a bad fruit, a uh, fruit that is useful or useless. So fruit can be judged. It is something that is revealed. Now, if you take note of the passage, Jesus, or the, the, the scripture, the apostle Paul in the scripture is saying that those who produce the fruit of the spirit against such, there is no law. Uh, that simply means there is no law against such people. That, that simply means nothing can be against you when you produce the fruit of the Spirit. No law, either in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament, can come against you when you produce the fruit of the Spirit. So, when we produce the Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, we are stepping out from condemnation, from the law coming against us to grace manifesting in our lives. Something that has no argument against it. So, just a couple of questions we need to answer. What is the fruit of the Spirit? What is it? Basically, the fruit of the Spirit is, is the character of Christ that is produced in the believer. The character of Christ that is produced in the believer. If Christ is truly in us, then this is his character in manifestation. The fruit of the Spirit, therefore, is the real proof that Christ is in us. 
So when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we read the Bible, we pray, we go to church, we worship, we sing, we dance. All of these are good, but none of them shows that you are a Christian. What shows that you are a Christian is the fruit of the Spirit. Not our dancing, as great as they are, not our singing, not our prayer, not even speaking in tongues. Demonstrates that we are Christians. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ produced in the believer. When Christ comes to live in us, he imparts his character to us. It's similar to what happens when a piece of metal like nail or pin, gets attached to a block of magnet. When a piece of metal, if you've conducted that experiment before, is attached to a magnet, the, there is an attraction. The piece of metal goes to where the magnet is and is attracted by the magnet. And, I, and when they stay in contact for a very long time, the nail or the pin stays in contact with the magnet for a long time. It is rubbing against the magnet. It is glued to the magnet. After some time, uh, the nail itself becomes magnetized. And then it is able to also magnetize other things. So the magnet imparts what it has the nail that is what happens when we have the fruit when we are connected to Christ when we stay in with him for a very long time over time we acquire his properties we acquire his character we acquire his nature the fruit of the spirit is the character of Christ manifesting in the believer but it's not only the character of Christ manifesting in the belief that the fruit of the spirit is the character of the believer revealed to the world. It is the character of the believer revealed to the world. The world sees that we are Christians by how much of Christ we reveal. These days, churches are full and it's good. I would rather churches are full than drinking pubs, nightclubs, being full. So if people are going to church in numbers, that is good. If people are attending churches in numbers, that is good. Churches are full on Sunday, that is good. But that is not all there is. Something must happen to those who are going to church. If they are encountering Christ, then the character of Christ in them must be revealed to the world. People must see that we are a different kind of people. We are their co-workers, we are their cousins, we are their brothers, we are their friends, we are their wives, we are their husbands. But that's not all. They may see that something in our lives is different from the rest of the world. It is the character of Christ, of, of the believer revealed to the world. So the question you want to ask yourself in this year of fruitfulness, what does the world see in me when they look at me? When I'm in the office and I'm working and I tell everybody I'm a Christian, I go to church, I go for crossover, I attend greater works, I wear the t-shirt. Is that all that they see, your t-shirt and what you say? Or there's something else they see that shows that you're a Christian. And what they must see is not your t-shirt. What they see must be the character of Christ revealed to them. So people can say of a truth, this person is a Christian. Not because you brag about it, but because you demonstrate it with your character. So if you are a Christian boss and you are seducing people in order to give them a job, whose character are you revealing? Are you revealing the works of the flesh or the fruit of the spirit? Of course, 
That is not the fruit of the Spirit. If you are a Christian and you are in a marriage, and your marriage is no different from an unbeliever, what fruit are you showing? What fruit are we showing? So the fruit of the Spirit is important. It's not enough for us to claim the blessing of God, the favor and breakthrough and turn around, which is all good. But we must manifest Christ. And the world must see that we are children. And the Lord Jesus Christ warned us very clearly in Matthew chapter 7. When he talks about prophets, and although we are tempted to apply it only to prophets, it applies to every believer. Not just the prophets. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So Jesus is saying, what they produce shows what tree they are. So if somebody is prophesying, or preaching and manifesting the works of the flesh, then it means the tree is the flesh. It's not the spirit. Because by their fruits, you would know the tree that they are of. If you're driving by and you see a tree that you can't identify, maybe it's dark. You can't tell what tree. You can't tell whether it's orange or mango or pear or guava tree. But then you look at the fruits and you see mangoes on it, you would know that the tree is a mango tree. And if you look at the fruits and it's orange, you say, oh yeah, I can't see the tree well, but the fruit shows that it's an orange tree. In the same way Jesus says, if you can't tell whether a person is of God or not, check the fruit. And the fruit he's talking about is what we are talking about, the fruit of the Spirit. In verse 18 to 20 of the same Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And please don't just apply this to prophets. Apply this to yourself. By their fruits, they will be known. So the question is, who produces the fruits? Who produces the fruits? There is a big debate as to whether the spirit in this verse is the spirit of the believer or the Holy Spirit. In other words, who bears the fruit? Is it the spirit of the believer or the Holy Spirit? bearing the fruit. So when we say the fruit of the Spirit, is it the fruit of the Holy Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit of the believer? The Lord Jesus answered that question in John chapter 15 verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus is talking about the vine, the branch, and the fruit. Now normally when you look at a tree and its branches, you see them as one and the same. But for the purposes of this, Jesus states the differentiation. The vine is the stem. And he says, I am the vine. The branch is the believer. The fruit therefore comes from the branch, from the believer. But Jesus also says, without me, you can do nothing. So although it's coming from the believer, it is also through the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ. So the answer is, who bears the fruit? The answer, the spirit of the believer in union with the Spirit of Christ. The branch is joined to the vine. And it is because it is joined to the vine It produces fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. Producing the fruit of the Spirit, therefore, is not based on hard work. You know, uh, I talked about the works of the flesh and the effort it takes to sin. But 
that what produces fruit is not hard work. It is submission. Once we submit to Christ, his fruit will manifest in our lives. So whereas it takes work to produce the works of the flesh, it takes grace to produce the fruit of the spirit. Without me, you can do nothing. And all the work Jesus says we should do is abide in me. Stay with me, trust me, believe me. So you, you don't go through your life squeezing your face and say, I will never sin, I will never sin. I will determine I will never sin. That's just you trying by your own self not to sin. Because if you're going to do it by yourself, you will sin. But if you're going to trust Jesus and stay close to him, then you will find that day by day, he gives you the strength to bear the fruit of the spirit. It's not of you and your strength, but it is of God who gives mercy. The fruit of the spirit, therefore, is not something we can boast in. You can't go around saying, as for me, I've never sinned before. It's not something for us to boast in. It's something for us to thank God for. Because it is by his grace that we manifest the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is produced together. You don't isolate them. You cannot say, as for me, I like joy. Because my wife is joy. I don't like long suffering. Oh, oh, I can, I'm not impatient. I'm impatient. I can't wait for anything. I want it. No, 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 no. Well, long suffering and patience are also fruit of the spirit. You can say, as for me, I like faith and faithfulness. But I don't like gentleness. Because the, where I was raised from, where I came from, nobody is gentle. If you are gentle, people will take advantage of you. Well, the fruit of the spirit is gentleness. Gentleness is not a weakness. Gentleness is sensitivity to other people. I have said it before that when you are giving something delicate, like you are carrying a bowl of eggs in your hand or you carry a lot of eggs in your hand you are very gentle with the eggs you are gentle you walk gently you are careful how you hold it why are you gentle is it because the egg is strong no it's because the egg is weak and you are strong and you are trying to protect with your strength something that is weak that is what gentleness is all about gentleness is using your strength to protect what is weak husbands you are strong protect your wives I'll say it again for the avoidance of doubt husbands you are strong protect your wives somebody said well if, if, if you are not careful the wife will, will now think that they are stronger than you the egg never thinks it is stronger the egg appreciates the strength that is protecting it so it never cracks and never breaks. When you are a leader, you are in a powerful position, you protect the weak. That is what gentleness is all about. And it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the spirit of the believer as well. The fruit of the spirit matures as we mature in Christ. As we grow in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit matures in us. Like every fruit, a fruit can be unripe or ripe. So there are people who produce the fruit of the Spirit, but it is unripe fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible says when you eat unripe fruit, your teeth will be set on edge. Your teeth will be set on edge. It's like somebody who loves you, but is insensitive. So he can visit you at 5 a.m. in the morning. Why are you here? Oh, brother, I love you. I was just praying up for you tonight, and I just felt I should come and just, and just share fellowship with you. 5 a.m.? It's love, but you have to be mature. 
So sometimes in showing love, we set people's teeth on edge. Sometimes in showing joy, we set people's teeth on edge. Like somebody is bereaved. Somebody has lost somebody. You go to him and say, oh, rejoice. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. That is joy, but it is immature joy. It's going to set people's teeth on edge. So the fruit of the spirit must not be produced just in its raw, unripened stage. It has to mature into the fullness of Christ so that when it is manifested, it can be consumed and it can be a blessing. My final scripture, Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28, verse 33 to 34. It is describing the garment of the high priest. The high priest had a garment called the effort. And this is how it is described. And upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all about. This is the description of the effort of the high priest. And the high priest's effort was like a tunic. Tunic. It's almost similar to what I am wearing is not like a jacket. This is uh, a, a garment that has a head, a place where you put your head like mine. So I'm not bad. <laughs> All right. Now at the hem of the garment of the high priest, that's the edge of it. There was an embroidery that is applied. And the passage says that the high priest's garment will have Pomegranate and a bell. Pomegranate and a bell. Pomegranate is a fruit. A bell is fabricated, a golden bell. And you have it all around. So all around you see fruit and a golden bell. Fruit, golden bell. Fruit, golden bell. All around. And one of the reasons is so that the bells don't jam into each other. The bells ring when the high priest is moving. And, and they don't have to be making noise and hitting each other so each bell hits a fruit and uh, and so all the bells are making a unique sound together and they don't make a jangling sound that cannot be discerned and that is why they had a fruit and a bell the pomegranate speaks of godly character revealed in us Godly character revealed in us. It's a fruit. The bells represent God's gifts demonstrated through us. So for the gifts that God gives us, which is the bell, there must be a fruit to cushion it. For every gift, there is a fruit. 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 If you are supremely gifted by God, but there is no fruit of the Spirit showing in your life, you're, 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 you, you produce something that people don't like. It's not that you don't have a gift, it's just that it doesn't have the fruit to insulate it from making an indiscernible sound. So if God gives me gifts, whatever the gifts are, whether it's speaking in tongues, or healing, or prophecy, or word of knowledge, or word of wisdom, all of these gifts must be supported by fruit. Interestingly, the gifts of the Spirit as they are set out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and the fruit of the Spirit are set out in Galatians chapter 5, and nine each. One gift, one fruit, one gift, one fruit, all around. 
And this is how the Apostle Paul describes when we have gift without fruit. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Tongues, speaking in tongues, gift, love, fruit. So Paul is saying if I have the gift and I have no fruit, I become a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. What does that mean? It means I'm making a lot of noise. But I'm not producing sound. So, if God has gifted you, there are some of you gifted by God, you're gifted so well by God, you see visions and you see dreams and you pray for people and things happen, but your character, your character, you are bells around the hem of the garment, everywhere you go, a lot of noise but nobody really senses Christ but if your gifts had the fruit of the spirit then people will hear your sound not that it's discernible sound it's music it is harmony it is blending it is a blessing Unfortunately, there are many people with gift, no fruit. And when you do that, people actually mock your gift. And diminish your gift. Because there is no fruit. So, for every believer, God has called us not only to be gifted, but to be fruited. For every believer, we must produce the fruit of the Spirit. We must produce love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self control. So ask yourself, me, ask myself, how much of this is in my life? How much of my life shows love? How much? How much shows joy? How much of my life shows the peace of God? Long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is not a list for pastors. This is a list for everybody who has Christ as their Lord and Savior. So in this year of fruitfulness, as we set out to build things, to plant things, to do mighty things let us begin right with the fruit of the spirit because if your spirit bears the right fruit your mind will bear fruit your hands will bear fruit your talents will bear fruit and all of that your talent and your gifts bearing fruit match with the fruit of the spirit will become the greatest testimony for Christ Jesus in this year of fruitfulness and may the Lord make us a testimony make our lives a testimony wherever we are as pastors as congregation members as business people as corporate leaders as politicians as teachers as doctors nurses wherever we function may god cause the help us to produce fruit that identifies us truly as children of the most high god let us pray Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word to us. And we thank you, Lord, for the challenge your word presents to us. And we know, Lord, that by ourselves we cannot produce fruit. Because we don't have what it takes. 
But because we are planted in Christ Jesus, because we are the branch of the vine, we have the ability. So help us, Lord, to get rid of the works of the flesh manifesting in our lives, that wherever we go, the aroma of Christ will be spread abroad. That wherever we go, people will see us. They will see our fruit and they will glorify our Father who is in heaven. May Christ be manifested in each one of us, Lord. And may his life be seen in our offices, in our homes, in our schools, in our churches. Wherever we go, may the character of Christ demonstrate his presence in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. And let's go produce some fruit. Amen.